Um. All right, let's get back to it. Time's not going any faster. Staying here until time shows up. We might as well go over the material, right? All right, so this week we were talking about uh, constitutional rights, how they apply on the internet. Really what we're talking about for the most part are a couple of specific constitutional rights as they pertain in a uh, more or less computer criminological sense to activities online, but broadly, uh, freedom of speech or the right to speech. Uh, we talked about last time, the internet is not American. Uh, you are an American on the internet. The website that you're ac accessing may be owned by a company based in the United States. Server assets could be based in the United States, but none of this necessarily immediately grants any particular rights or another to your activity with them because the internet is a global communications platform and uh, very quickly falls apart on a number of different factors. Number one, primarily, the website that you are probably interacting with is a private enterprise and uh, the Bill of Rights is only a description of rights afforded to you in your dealings with the government. Um, which means that while we can talk about freedom of speech and we can't deny that speech is obviously critical to the internet, it is a communication platform after all, and we can't deny that the activities on the internet affect society. In terms of rights, well, we can kind of forget about that. That said, in terms of your rights with the government, uh, they actually are, in a way, not usually talked about in this context, but they actually are under threat from the government. So you hear a lot these days, at least in certain circles, particularly Tucker, Car uh, sorry, Tucker Carlson. I, I keep trying to call him Carl Tuckelson for some reason in my head, but I have to remember son of Carl, one who tucks, Tucker Carlson, in order to remember this American. Tucker Carlson, particularly if you watch him, makes a big deal about cancel culture. And we are gonna talk about that and what that means, but while much is made of it from that perspective, the true threat to free speech online is not coming from a cabal of liberals who want to silence conservatives. It is in fact coming from the government who is supposed to be able to, or is, is supposed to honor our rights that are provided to us in the Bill of Rights. It takes the guise of federal regulation in the form of what's known affectionately as net neutrality. Uh, true branding, last week we talked about effective messaging. Net neutrality, framing an argument in that fashion is a perfect example of the kind of messaging and propaganda that gets you a million miles with just a small turn of phrase uh, because the term net neutrality sounds really great. But when the net neutrality argument first came about uh, way back in uh, around 08 or so, uh, net neutrality was actually the term that was afforded by proponents of federal regulation to regulate the internet or essentially to <laughs> restrict content based on a number of different factors. And the term became so confusing uh, that now whenever somebody talks about net neutrality, it's kind of a coin toss on whether or not they mean classic flavor net neutrality, which is I support the telecom's right to influence the internet and <laughs> real brand net neutrality, which is I support a neutral internet. So the history of that and the restrictions of speech just on the horizon for all of us comes not from the regulation of indecency. As we talked about last time, we can't in the United States really regulate decency because that is a moral judgment in a legal sense. <clears throat> um, what we can regulate is obscenity, but we have a difficult time doing that as well. And the FCC as a governmental regulatory body it is not within their purview necessarily to regulate morality in the first place. Um, it just, you have to take all that through the court system. It just takes too long. 
So instead, the argument is, uh, focuses more on classic censorship, as we saw uh, way back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s with new media technologies, uh, which was uh, content regulation or uh, access, uh, private enterprise, business. Businesses can be regulated. As a matter of fact, the primary mechanism of our government is not to provide us freedom and lollipops and sunshine and all that kind of stuff. It is to enforce contracts, to regulate business, to ensure fair competition, primarily, more than anything else. The purse strings, as Marbury versus Madison, an early Supreme Court case, first noted. Um, last time we also talked about that concept of obscenity and indecency and about how even though there's some regulated content that is patently obscene, how it seems to slip through the cracks. And we opened up this week talking about how the internet is for porn um, and about how that prurient interest, that obscene material sort of in a way drives or at least directs the trajectory of technology in certain fashions. The adoption of VHS over Betamax, over DVD, over VHS, over the internet, over DVD, over VR, over uh, standard definition, yeah, high definition, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, this obscene material that's out there is not new. 4chan is not new, of course, but it predates any of the Chan boards, 2chan, 4chan, 8chan, or uh, Anon IB, or any of the other image boards that happen to be out there. Um, essentially, what we have is an unmistakable coalescence of different immutable truths in the human condition and our desire to communicate, uh, which is that, yes, for all of the lofty goals and purposes that the internet does provide for us in our society, being a neutral platform for public discourse, a public forum for the airing of grievances, uh, setting agendas, a uh, marketplace of both ideas, goods, and services, um, you know, there is unmistakably, as we saw in the cave painting earlier on this semester, an unmistakable undercurrent also of horny thoughts that go about with human communication as well. And while some of that material may be undesirable by certain government regulatory agencies um, or otherwise, uh, we simply cannot eliminate them because they are so integral to any human communication platform. What I'm getting at here. Uh, is that while we see obscene materials on 4chan, the question for those who would regulate such content or those who would enforce the laws as they currently exist comes down to a question of whether or not those fights are worth having. And if we're going to talk about the essence of free speech and free speech being regulated, regulated, whether it's through net neutrality or what some might deem to be cancel culture or what have you, um, the question remains, can this fight even be won? And the reason that much of this content remains out there, as we talked about last time, is that in a legal sense, it cannot, but also in a very real sense, it's just a fire that can't be put out. It's just part and parcel of communication. And the question then is, if that fight were to be won, would it be replaced by something much worse? And unmistakably, the answer is, Yes, it absolutely would. The reason being is that pre-internet times, we do have plenty of evidence to show this. So you uh, probably have heard, uh, I'm not sure if this was a thing with your generation, but it certainly was with mine. The reason that it took so long for marijuana to be decriminalized and is still in the process of being decriminalized throughout much of the United States is effective messaging by anti-drug advocates which were supported by special interest groups and lobbyists and uh, it being an unpopular topic for most politicians to take up as a cause. And this was of course long before the president decided to pardon 6,500 marijuana possession offenders. The uh, um, messaging at the time was that marijuana is a gateway drug. So effectively, if you try one thing, a slippery slope argument, it leads to others. Slippery slope, of course, an obvious logical fallacy, which, I mean, let's be honest here, no effective messaging is ever going to consider as long as it works. Well, while you should be skeptical, uh, skeptical of slippery slope arguments, places like 4chan that do host obscene content, patently obscene content, even that which even if there were a will and a way to fight, um, 
it exists out there. And if it were to be fought, what would happen? Well, as we see with pre-internet, um, well, let's say, uh, let's just call them deviant criminal subcultures, right? The exchanging and sharing of contraband images predates the internet by a long shot, going way back into the days first of photo development. And even before that, uh, with erotic stories that were written and traded in dime stores on boardwalks uh, all around the, the world. Um, these deviant subcultures, obviously, they, as we talked about before, tend to nucleate around these interests. And the fact that they are deviant leads to social bonding. The fact that they are criminally deviant only leads to stronger social bonding and a need to circumvent otherwise accessible social welfare programs. So like, for example, if you are a heavy drug user, okay, you're a heavy drug user, that's going to mean that you're going to be hanging out with other heavy drug users. A drug culture will develop. There are tons of drug cultures out there. There is, in fact, a drug culture for every drug that has ever existed. But because they are criminally deviant, that means that, let's say, you're very high and you fall down the stairs, you can't take advantage of otherwise easily accessible social welfare programs like hospitals or police or firefighters, because if you call them, they'll know you're high and you'll go to jail. So criminal deviant subcultures tend to develop parasocial programs along those lines. One person in the group might be halfway decent with first aid or is at least trusted, and they kind of become the group doctor. So we see that in every criminally deviant subculture. And so these uh, subcultures that develop along these lines, including those that share contraband images. We'll just, uh, why polish a turd here? Let's just say pedophile groups. Okay, we'll just use the word instead of pretending like we don't know what it is. So pedophile groups develop the same thing. It's more than just sharing illicit content. Indeed, they share a lot of other like uh, parasocial type organizations. So they seek out these places and tend to develop these social bonds because they're doing things like sharing uh, ideology of justification, right? They realize what they're doing is bad, or at least they're told that it's bad by the mainstream culture. And so they'll support each other and encourage each other and so on. They'll act as each other's safety nets, right? After a fashion. Now, where I'm getting at with this is we have places like the image boards that host this obscene content. And we say, you know, why isn't this dealt with? Well, because we know from all of these studies of these social groups going far back before the internet is that all that happens is they don't disappear. They just go elsewhere and might be harder to find. One way that we combat that is by attacking the technology itself, which is why you don't find groups like that very often anymore on the dark web as we used to. It's the first place they went as soon as it became available. Now it's moved back into the regular clear net happening in various different places all over the place. So if we get rid of essentially uh, image boards where we know these uh, images congregate, it makes it much harder for us to find the worst places, right? So uh, it's a combination of factors. Number one, a fight that is difficult to win uh, in a legal sense in the United States, um, and also eliminating an essential site of intelligence for law enforcement if uh, they do need to track something like this down. Uh, these image boards are not nearly as anonymous as they would have you believe, of course, there have been plenty of cases like that. And um, just in general, um, Eliminating these sites doesn't get rid of the content, it just distributes it and makes it much more difficult to uh, get this kind of uh, intel information or at least um, bottle things up in a way that seems roughly manageable under the circumstances. Uh, consider it you know, along the same lines of making a tackle the tactical decision or a strategic decision. Um, recently, um, in the Russian and Ukraine conflict, the bridge to Crimea was recently attacked via a car bomb. And um, many uh, had speculated as to uh, why Ukraine had not struck earlier on this one. And um, while it seems as if Ukraine is being assigned blame for the destruction of the bridge, 
I personally have seen some compelling evidence to believe that it may have been a less than official actor in some fashion or another. The reason being is that in a game theory sense, leaving the bridge intact provides a better outcome in almost every situation for Ukraine uh, than destroying the bridge. Because of course, destroying the bridge is their major, uh, Russia's main avenue into Southern Ukraine, into the Crimea, um, where they're bringing goods, services, weapons, soldiers, and so on. So it seems like, hey, that'd be a good idea to destroy that. But destroying it means that Russia has fewer options and there's no way to negotiate by continuing to threaten the bridge and so on and so forth. Uh, let's not analyze this issue. The situation essentially what I'm saying is comparable because if we destroy 4chan, we're just leaving ourselves with fewer options in the end. We just don't have, <laughs> we don't have the ability to monitor it. We don't have the ability to use it as a tool. Uh, we don't have the <laughs> ability to use it as a distraction and so on and so forth. Now, who does benefit from uh, moderating or from filtering that kind of content? Well, this, right? 4chan has a lot of users, uh, not as many as other uh, social media outlets, I suppose, if we were to say that they were a social media outlet, but um, the telecom companies allowing access to that kind of content, they're the only ones who really benefit from any form of censorship in this regard. So uh, this is not a new thing, uh, particularly in times of moral panic. We do um, currently not necessarily live in a time of moral panic because we have far too many actual things to worry about. But human beings are also, uh, tend to want to be distracted, right? It's hard for human beings to have good times. There's always gotta be something to bellyache about. And so if you think about eras of prosperity, such as, the uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s, punctuated, of course, by various economic crises on our way to today, obviously, um, or uh, in eras past, like the uh, brief times in the 80s and so on, after, of course, the economic crises of the 70s. Uh, human beings will invent problems where you know we don't have anything actually important to worry about. And so through those periods, we see times of moral panic. And in the 80s, it was all about uh, worshiping Satan and rock and roll and Dungeons and Dragons and whatnot, corrupting the nation's youth. In the 90s, uh, it was, well, rock and roll and video games and such corrupting the nation's youth. I want somebody to think of the children. Um, so this is not a new effort. Um, in the, in the early 2000s and the 90s, sanitizing the internet was also a major cause of moral panic and so on. Um, however, uh, doing any of that uh, has gotten us scarcely any farther than we were before. The great victory of the 90s was the parental content warning sticker that you see on every album that's sold in the United States. In the uh, 80s, the big win was the uh, Motion Picture Association of America's voluntarily submitting to a rating system, um, which wasn't good enough for some, which is why you also get independent sites. Uh, what was it like? <sighs> like christianmoms.org or something like that. It's some site like that. I can't remember the actual domain, uh, but something like that where <laughs> uh, they will vocally and publicly take issue with the ratings of movies. For example, this shouldn't be rated G uh, because the bunny looks lovingly at another bunny in Bambi or something like that. <laughs> but still, the, the major victory there being things like rating systems. And we stand for that as a society because of course, a rating system doesn't at least apparently uh, seem to do much in terms of censorship. You're just allowing consumers more accurate information as to what they are about to consume. However, as we hinted at last time, the truth of the matter is, is that even light censorship in that fashion does indeed have some manner of influence because there have been movies threatened with a strong rating who have self-censored in order to remain economically viable. That's really what this is all about, right? Uh, it's about maybe a moral sort of uh, imperative, uh, certain people certainly feeling the need to regulate these kinds of things in order to uh, have the best possible societal outcome in their opinion. 
But ultimately, what is the great motivator, again, in human behavior is the pursuit of comfort and the avoidance of discomfort. And uh, people at the higher echelons of society equate comfort with money. And so that's why we end up with economic incentives in this fashion. So what we're seeing with the net neutrality argument is not censorship in a classic sense. It's merely content filtering, filtering or content categorization which ends up looking a little something like this, just like we used to have with cable packages. If you, <laughs> I have not had cable since 2002, personally, but I do vividly remember these sales pitches. For example, you get your, your basic 500 meg of free transfers for 30 bucks a month. But if you want to do searches, you got to get the Pathfinder package. That's plus five dollars. Uh, if you want, uh, let's see here, we have the Marketplace package. You can go to Amazon. Just going to cost you an extra five a month. Uh, you get the social media package for free because, of course, that's going to draw people in in order to sign up to begin with. But if you want streaming media, ten dollars a month, fifteen dollars a month after it's a plan. It's an introductory price just just for signing up as a thank you, and so on. Now this is uh, uh, this this day here where we, we see stuff like this. I, I'm not here to be an alarmist, and I suppose at the end of the day, this is my personal opinion. But many see something like this, and they think, well, this is just simply not going to happen. It's the internet; it's not possible. Let me tell you, as someone who has studied this topic, it is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, it could be done. It is not anything in the way of a technical imposition for internet service providers to do this right now. They absolutely could do it right now. It's merely, it's merely social momentum or what little remains in the internet that has prevented them from doing this thus far. And you might say, well, then VPN. The internet service provider that you're using can tell if you're using a VPN. And they'll just shut it down. Uh, one of the things I did when I first, uh, so I, I've been a US cellular customer for uh, many years. Uh, not that long ago, I decided to hop companies over to T-Mobile. Do not recommend, terrible idea. <laughs> but the first thing I did when I had my phones is I, okay, so I get the phone. I'm on their data plan, I'm checking it out. And I notice that at around five o'clock every day, from the first day I got it until the last day I got rid of it, um, major slower, like noticeably slower. And then I, so of course I had to investigate. So I started running tests on it and, and sure enough, unmistakably, there was throttling going on. So I took it upon myself to go into the phone and T-Mobile uses a configuration system in order to whitelist devices and so on on their network. So I take it upon myself to experiment with that and push my own config in my phone and get rid of the throttling. Uh, it took them about a week before they contacted me and wanted to know uh, if there was a problem with my phone, if I had to factory reset it or if there was an issue and I could bring it in to a store and have them take a look at it and so on. Um, and uh, after that, I uh, decided to install a VPN client on my phone and see what would happen. And then around the same time every day, Instead of uh, connection speed dropping to a snail's pace, it just dropped entirely, right? Um, because they can tell. And um, even if they don't know exactly where you're going, um, that's fine. Because under a system like this, if they don't know where you're going, then they will block you because that's how they're charging you. They just assume it's a way to get around your contract or something. So uh, technology like VPNs is simply not the answer. Uh, onion routing is simply not the answer. Anything. Uh, short of a free and open, i.e. more or less what we've enjoyed since the inception of the internet, or the public internet anyway, uh, will not help us here, will not help us at all. Uh, and this economic model, although not that far off in the future and certainly possible right now, uh, we do have other economic incentives with the internet that does lead to a form of censorship, right? If you see the news package down here, MSNBC, Fox, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Huffington Post, New York Times, and so on. Well, right now in the United States, at a time when we 
could use unfettered access to real news more than ever. And we did talk about this before. Out of the one, two, three, four, looks like 10 sites there in the news package, if you visit four of them, the four that would be considered maybe potentially new sources of record, if you were to visit them, economics has dictated you won't be able to get the news anyway because you're going to hit a paywall and you're going to have to pay three bucks. Uh, I don't even know what it is. Last time I went to New York Times, I'm pretty sure it was three bucks per article unless you subscribe. And I think a subscription is like 12 bucks a year. So it's not like they're asking for a lot, but that's how we're getting nickel and dimed, right? We're paying um, 10, 12, 15 bucks a month for each of our streaming services, um, a couple bucks a month for each news source. Uh, we're getting billed monthly for uh, MMOs. Um, I'm not sure if there's any. I do know of one social media platform that you had to pay to join, but that didn't last very long. And I think it was a Ponzi scheme um, and so on. But look at the, the actual free access to real information that we even have here today. Uh, why the fuck is Napster on there? Is Napster still around? Is there like a new streaming service for Napster that I'm not aware of? Well, anyway, uh, Pandora, Spotify, Rhapsody, and so on, all of those are free slash subscription services unless you want ads. That's how they're monetizing that information. But the actual free sources of information here are, you know, over here, Wikipedia, and the other free sources, YouTube, Google, Yahoo, Flickr, um, the free services over here, these, all of these free services up here in social media and so on, we are paying for them. We're just not paying for them with money. We're paying for them with our information. So economics is really what drives these decisions. And that's why, unless there is a major grassroots social movement to keep the internet free, um, we are going to get this instead of the terrible system we already have, which is major conglomerates cobbling everything up and then taking our data to monetize. All right. So I did say uh, we would talk about cancel culture, and so we shall. So a reminder, the First Amendment does not obligate any private organization from providing a platform to anybody. It is ironic that those who decry cancel culture most are using gigantic platforms to do so. As I said, son of Carl, one who talks, Tucker Carlson, uses his show, which has millions and millions of viewers, uh, every single week? Is it a daily show? Is it a weekly show? I see him a lot. I assume it's daily. But he's using that gigantic platform in order to decry what is cancel culture. And here an important distinction needs to be made because I've been using that term. Uh, uh, but ultimately, if we were to try to wring some kind of definition from the various different complaints that we hear about it, ultimately what those complaints generally come down to is person said a thing, people don't like it, people tell person they don't like thing, and they don't like people now, right? That's not really anything, because you have no right to be protected from the consequences of your speech. You never have. Nobody ever has. Nor does the First Amendment obligate anyone to listen to anyone, right? If you have freedom to speak, other people have freedom to ignore you. And most of the time when we're talking about what has been termed the cancel culture, I really, I really don't like the fact that the term has been co-opted by all of these people because it's a pretty good term. There's alliteration in everything. It really triggers my kindergartner brain, but unfortunately that's, that is what it is, right? It's come down to certain individuals saying a thing, it being unpopular and then suffering from the unpopularity of their statements. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so yeah, unfortunately that term seems to have been co-opted. Now the problem, and there is a problem here, there is an identifiable problem. Just like with most of the things that people vehemently decry on uh, Tucker Carlson's show or any other shows like that, there is a seed of truth in it. There is a problem that should be discussed, identified, and dealt with, but it's very rarely the conclusions that they draw. And with cancel culture, or I should say, not necessarily with the problem with the First Amendment not covering people's uh, right to be idiots. Um, there is the problem of, well, you may not have the right to be an idiot, but people tend to be idiots. I've said plenty of dumb stuff today, earlier this week, throughout this entire semester, throughout my entire career, throughout my entire life, okay? 
I talk a lot. I can't be held responsible for the things that come out of my mouth, okay? So all I have no right to be an idiot, we should at least at some point acknowledge that people can say, do, think stupid things. And so the problem then in this distinction in terminology is that what, we're, we, what we could call cancel culture uh, has been co-opted. Instead, the problem is not the fact that there are repercussions for people's speech, it's that there are people who are facing public shaming who do not truly deserve it. As I mentioned before, a book I recommend on the subject is So You've Been Publicly Shamed by John Ronson, wherein there are a couple of case studies. Now, one of those case studies, two individuals who went to an IT conference. Uh, these two individuals had been working at a company. They went to this conference themselves um, as part of a professional development type trip. So that was authorized by their employer. And, you know, they're a couple of introverted, geeky guys. They're talking to themselves. They're the only two people they know at the conference. So they're hanging out together, sticking close, safety and numbers kind of situation. Um, and they're making jokes, you know, because they're the, uh, the talk that they're at uh, mentioned a hardware dongle. And introverted, geeky guys, uh, dongle, right? Talking to each other. Um, someone in front of them hears that, takes exception to it turns around, takes their picture, posts it on social media, long story short, um, they end up losing their jobs and so on. And in the book, John interviews the woman and the two men to see how things ended up for them. And the two men were truly apologetic. Uh, they did not have an opportunity. They did not realize that they had offended anyone. Uh, even to that day, several years removed from the incident, they were extremely apologetic for having accidentally offended anyone, and they felt no ill will towards the person who had posted that image of them online saying, uh, you know, that they were being inappropriate or something like that. Uh, the woman, for her part, who posted that on social media, um, she felt no um, remorse or at all for, for her actions or, or for the two men losing their jobs. Um, and this is in the book. Her opinion may have changed. I had not researched this to get the updated version for current day, um, but, um, you know, felt like what they had done and said was inappropriate and they should have known better and they were grown ups and so on and so forth. Now, that's all well and good. Uh, I think that that may be one example of a case where really nobody really deserved a lot of outcome from it. It seemed like a stupid misunderstanding, but that's what we have when we have a mass media communication platform at our fingertips. We have to expect that things will be blown out of proportion because guess what? That's not a flaw of the internet. That's a flaw of human communication. We really like to blow things out of proportion sometimes, i.e. see two slides ago and we were looking at or talking about moral panics. But ultimately, who really suffered as a result of that? Of course, everyone in that case, including the person who posted the image to social media, they all lost their jobs, all of them, because none of their employers wanted to have anything to do with them after they had been publicly shamed. It brought attention, negative attention to their organizations. Uh, both of those two gentlemen, however, were pretty easily able to secure other jobs and get back to work at another place. Whereas she, in the book up to that point, continued to struggle to find employment. Now, my opinion is that that could perhaps be an example of the asymmetry that we see in what really is public shaming and why cancel culture as the term has come to be applied is not really a thing. Because ultimately, what Mr. Carlson is complaining about is the fact that people say things, other people notice, those people take exception to it. And essentially what he's complaining about is people who would otherwise not be heard having a voice. And that's the dumbest thing in the world to complain about in 2022, <laughs> because we have the internet. That's the whole point of it, is we have an ability to communicate that if a message uh, strikes a chord enough with the public, it will be heard and shared. It's like going on a ship in March and complaining the water's choppy. Sorry, that's just the way it works. But uh, in terms of the problem with public shaming, the issue is that when those messages are caught and broadcast and heard, just like everything else that's out on the internet, it no longer belongs to us, it belongs to the world. That means that once the genie's out of the bottle, there's no reeling it back in, right? Uh, in an instant, at a conference, one day, normal to everyone else, all of their lives were changed. Not necessarily forever, but enough, at least in the short term, to have 
serious problems out as a result. And even if any of them wanted to change things, if those gentlemen could go back in time and not make stupid remarks at the conference, if she could go back in time and not put it on Twitter, so she didn't really seem that that was something that she did to ever even consider, um, maybe they would, maybe they would. Uh, another example case study from that book, a woman uh, who at an airport um, awaiting a flight, a long flight overseas, sitting bored in the airport, um, and she is, I think, flying, yes, yes, she is flying to, not from Africa. Um, before she boards, she makes a fairly tasteless, although, I mean, let's be honest here, ultimately it's a banal joke, she says something along the lines of uh, flying to Africa, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you want to know what exactly what she said, check out the book, uh, but says something along the lines of flying to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, oh wait, I'll be fine, I'm white, ha ha ha, posts it directly before getting on the flight, like 14 hour flight. She lands and Twitter is going crazy about it. It's being shared all over the place. I mean, it's Twitter. And I don't need to tell you that much has been made in the context of quote unquote cancel culture uh, of people's even old tweets getting drug up, right? And this is why uh, people like Tucker Carlson latch on or latched on to that term. Because what we're really talking about is public shaming. And in, in her case, public shaming for something she had just done, but in some cases, public shaming for things that people had said on social media years and years ago. There is a distinct unfairness with that that I think all of us can resonate with because again, all of us have said something stupid. Has anyone ever not put their foot in their mouth? Not one of us can honestly say yes. Come on. <laughs> Obviously that's not the case. But there's an inherent unfairness. In it. This woman, when she landed, uh, the issue is that or it was retweeted and retweeted and retweeted and retweeted, and it got blown out of proportion uh, to the point where, yeah, she too lost her job and had really difficult times finding additional jobs. Why? Because her job was in public relations. <laughs> That's why, right? Just like people like. Uh, oh, it wasn't the Russo brothers, uh, uh, the, the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, Tim Gunn, James Gunn, James Gunn, thank you. Um, that's why they tend to be the targets of this kind of not, I'm not using the term cancel culture anymore, this kind of public shaming, because they're public figures. And um, again, it's a great egalitarian communication system. So there are people out there who would target people who they feel are in positions of power or authority, and in their estimation, hold them accountable for things that they have said before, which is, I think, fair enough. It's a little bit different when it's public relations executive, and it's definitely very different when it's maybe just some um, teacher or something, right? Uh, it gets their tweets dragged up from when they were 16, right? What I'm getting at is that what is often termed cancel culture is merely belly aching about the fact that people can say things and then have consequences for their speech when really the thing that is most unfair and it's a sliding scale at that is the public shaming aspect that comes along with it because while we have developed this communication platform and we do have the freedom to say whatever we want on it, we are not free from those consequences and we don't have a mechanism really uh, for tempering the reaction to these, right? What is the reaction to something like publicly shaming? Well, case studies in the book vary. Um, for most of them, they did the apology video, right? The apology video, as I'm sure you're aware, is not exactly a reliable response to public shaming. I would say, and I'm sure there are studies on this, but just my estimation, anecdotal as it is, uh, is probably like probably less than 50-50, okay? Because apology videos are productions and you need to nail that performance in order for it to work. Oddly enough, there is one case study in the book where the person at issue faced no consequences as a result of their public shaming. And I'll tell you what they did, but first let me tell you why they were shamed. So the individual in the book in this case study, 
a famous individual, particularly over in the uh, UK, yes, particularly over in the UK is a descendant of the head of the fascist movement in the 1930s in the United Kingdom. Already a person with a fair amount of, let's say, social stigma attached to their name, but also one with wealth, authority, and power, even still, right? He is, after all, still nobility over there. Well, it came out um, via the tabloid journals uh, that this person had been frequenting quote unquote German sex dungeons in London. Uh, and there were pictures and video of it as well. Now, this is the kind of thing that for many other celebrities caught in a scandal like that would uh, be a major public shaming, potentially leading to loss of jobs and face and so on. But for this individual, um, it didn't. They didn't issue an apology video. They didn't issue a retraction. They didn't sue anybody. They did absolutely nothing. They did absolutely nothing about it. And whenever questioned by journalists over their activity, they just had no shame about it. Public shaming is a reinforcement mechanism of social norms. We've already talked earlier, just to remind you, between legal norms and social norms. When we violate legal norms, we pay a fine or we go to jail or both. When we violate social norms, we face social stigma. And for this individual, they faced no stigma. They had no shame. They did nothing. That might be the best response of all to public shaming. But it does send the message to the public that you don't care. And this person had the luxury of doing that because they were already wealthy, which is why it's a sliding scale of responsibility, a sliding scale of shame. But the internet has a way of catching on like wildfire and just blowing things out of proportion. So for those uh, like prolific YouTube entrepreneur, Andrew Tate, I'm sure you've all heard of by now. If you have been fortunate enough to avoid Andrew Tate on the internet, very briefly, okay, uh, Andrew Tate, depending on what circles you visit, uh, is either a martial arts master and alpha male guru or virtual pimp and professional sleazeball, okay? Uh, Andrew Tate is one of those uh, guys uh, who literally starts up companies telling people uh, to sign up, cost $5,000, and it'll teach you the secret to being a successful alpha male, those, those kind of people, uh, to the part where in his own, in, I, I, and I stress, this is not coming from a social media source, on his own site, in his own materials, Andrew, how did you make your money? Answer, webcam. One word, webcam. <laughs> Can you expound on that? And in that text, it says his job essentially was to go out all over the world and meet beautiful women and date them and then convince them to join his cam service as a cam girl. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. He's a virtual pimp. <laughs> that was his job. And so as a result of this, uh, obviously he needed to take advantage economically of the current systems on the internet. And as we talked about before, oh wait, sorry, did we skip that? Did I save that for the, the manipulation unit? I might have, I probably shouldn't have because now I'm gonna talk about it. There's certain types of ways content goes viral online, okay? Uh, one of those ways, you might have seen is gonna be something that is particularly surprising, particularly relevant, wholesome, uh, or basically elicits, ah, shit, I should have covered that last week. Okay. Um, basically, uh, in social engineering, when we're talking about different tactics, we did cover hard and soft tactics. Those hard and soft tactics, as we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, I guess, elicit certain emotions, and there are two primary vectors of emotions that leads to participation and essentially viralness of content. Uh, one of them is the um, type of emotion, positive or negative, and the other one essentially is the velocity of the emotion. How much does it elicit a response and a need to act? So, um, essentially, one of the ways that you can do that is through good content, make people feel good, but also 
make it something that's easily shareable, something that's easily relatable, that kind of thing. The other way is by having something that is so obviously <laughs> repulsive and repugnant that people feel negatively about it, but still have that emotional velocity to share it. Like, can you believe this asshole kind of content, right? Andrew Tate, being a man of the people, of course, keenly aware of how the internet works after many, many failed ventures, uh, was able to uh, use social media platforms like YouTube and Twitter and so on in order to produce repulsive content tailored to do two things. Number one, uh, to get the attention of anybody who reads it, and number two, to attract a certain demographic of consumer. And so uh, that is what he did, but unfortunately had pushed a little bit too far, crossing the bounds of what uh, these platforms consider to be good tastes amongst, uh, or at least, well, good taste, I guess, is one thing. I don't think anyone's ever been banned from any social media platforms for having poor taste, but definitely crossing the line in the terms of service and leading to essentially a revocation of accounts across multiple social media platforms, basically undermining Tate's entire alpha male empire. Um, at least him directly. Now, um, that uh, in certain places online is being cited as an example of cancel culture and other such personalities that do play the internet algorithm game by posting repugnant content. It's happened before and will happen again. But is that cancel culture? No, because the idiot got on the Apple box. The Apple box doesn't belong to him. And even if it did belong to the government, nobody is obligated to ignore them. Or, I'm sorry, nobody is obligated to listen to them. They're allowed to ignore them. Uh, the Apple box in this case belongs to a private company. They're under no obligation to platform any content that they personally find objectionable. So as far as the moral order, uh, the idea is, is that no, the government does not set that. Private companies do. That's where we're at. That's what we have right now. Um, what else was I going to say? Eh, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, let's talk about some of these limitations of free speech that the government can um, impose here. So again, as we talked about before, the government does have the ability to regulate speech anyway. So the time, place, and manner, oh yeah, that's right. That's what I was going to say on that last slide regarding Andrew Tate. You might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, didn't we talk about Lester Packingham Jr. not that long ago? who was a convicted sex offender, who as a condition of parole was prevented from using social media. And the Supreme Court ruled that there's a constitutional right to access that kind of thing. Uh, yes, that's the distinction between someone like Andrew Tate and someone like Lester Packingham Jr. is that uh, that was to access the public forum of the internet, not uh, to uh, post on it. And the government would not be able to force Facebook as a private corporation to allow his speech anyway. So Andrew Tate can still go on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> he just can't post. Uh, and uh, even if he did sue them, uh, the government would not be able to force somebody like Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube to platform somebody. That's the distinction. So uh, different, different case entirely. All right, sorry. So um, yes, the government may not force a person to endorse any symbol, slogan, or pledge. Uh, private companies in the United States are considered persons in more ways than one. Just short of actually being able to literally vote for candidates, they are considered persons uh, for most other things with regards to our political system. And they are considered persons when it comes to civil rights as well. So uh, the government cannot force me as an individual to endorse any symbol, slogan, or pledge. They cannot force any organization or corporation to uh, uh, endorse any symbol, slogan, or pledge either. And that's why if you get deplatformed, you don't have a case. You simply don't. In addition to that, the government can regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. Um, as long as they remain as neutral as possible about this, they leave substantial other opportunities for speech to take place, and they narrowly serve a significant state interest. Back in the uh, W. Bush administration days, uh, due to 
heavy criticism in the media over the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, in, response, in response, the administration set up what were called free speech zones at public events, little fenced off areas where the press corps was allowed to be as long as they remained out of camera shot of anything else. There were plenty of cases on a first amendment basis that were filed by news organizations over this, but all things considered, um, although they cared a lot about the situation, it wasn't something that really got a lot of attention. Most of those cases were stalled. Those that were decided essentially uh, aired on the side of the administration saying uh, that there were other opportunities for speech to take place. There was nothing stopping them from reporting from their little free speech zones and so on. Uh, that and also what undermined those cases for those news organizations during that administration, believe it or not, was the public internet, which at that point had become a major thing for uh, news dissemination. Essentially what they were saying is that the free speech zones in the context of the news that's being broadcast out over the internet isn't such a big deal because the stories are still getting out there. A very interesting case, and that's why print media died so fast. Uh, state-owned property does not constitute a public forum. So this is a state school, and as a state school, we do have to follow uh, several important laws on the books in the state of Wisconsin. But um, despite what previous chancellors may have led you to believe, as a state school, we do not have to provide a public forum for people that would come on this campus and scream at students. I don't know, this was a couple of years ago. You guys might not have been here yet. A couple of years ago, 2017 or 2018, uh, we had some people come to campus in an effort to incite a reaction. I assume violence, but I don't know for sure. But they would take up posts outside of classroom buildings by the main entrance and exit, and they would hurl insults, particularly at female students, about traditional gender norms and everyone should be wearing skirts and why are you getting a degree, don't you want a family, and blah, 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 which obviously students, regardless of gender, took great exception to because what the fuck are you doing on a college campus shouting this kind of shit at students? Doesn't the school have an obligation to keep students safe? And they didn't touch anybody, but they got right in people's faces and they were screaming. It seemed to me as a mere adjunct lecturer that it was obvious that we should probably get campus police involved and get these people trespassed off the property as soon as possible. The chancellor at the time, not our current chancellor, of course, no, he's great. Most wonderful chancellor we've ever had. Can't imagine anybody doing a better job. This all goes towards my pay packet, I think, I don't know. <laughs> but the previous chancellor um, waffled on the issue, as did the vice chancellor for student affairs, which definitely this is their problem. Uh, instead, mealy mouthed, hand wringing, saying, oh, I don't know, they have a first amendment right. This is a public university, what do we do? Oh, I don't know. Because I will note that this university has no dedicated general counsel. Uh, and I don't yet have my JD, so I couldn't pick up the phone and say, I got a JD, kick him off the fucking campus. We're allowed to do that. So instead, it was a lot of hand wringing for the rest of the day, leaving our students in, uh, well, let's just say that they, they didn't feel as safe that day as they should have, uh, but eventually the problem was dealt with. And that's because the assumption is that public property is public property, and that's not the case. Just like I can't walk into the police station down over there on Michigan Avenue and say, this is public property. I pay your, I pay your salary with my taxes. I'm going back there in the jail. I'm gonna go hang out though. I can't do that because it's restricted, right? Even though it's public property, even though yes, my taxes pay for all of that. I can't just saunter off into, into area, any area just because it's public property. Just like if people come on this campus and we truly do not want them here and we believe that they may constitute a threat or at least an inciting or unwanted presence, we simply can go up to them and we can say, I need you to leave the property right away. They can argue all they want. I guarantee the law is on your side. All right, so the government can not regulate the content of speech, just the time, place, and manner. There are 
other provisos, though, where they can regulate content. In fact, there are six exceptions to when the state has what's known as a compelling state interest to regulate the content of speech. And we already talked about a couple of these obscenity. Obviously, we talked about anything that would be obscene is something that the government can regulate. And that includes, of course, especially obscene materials like child pornography. Um, and in this case, as we talked about last time, uh, the material is sort of ipso facto by default considered to be obscene, but even material that isn't, that may, might meet another definition, like for example, um, oh, what was her name? Annie Bell. Annie Bell was a photographer in the uh, 70s and 80s, did most of her work uh, taking pictures, uh, candid pictures of children all around the United States and not in the child pornography sense, it was in an artistic sense. Uh, just children being children in various different places. But occasionally, of course, her photographs might contain a partial nudity or something like that if kids are skinny dipping or something. Uh, and her work, despite it not being pornography and meeting the definition of having artistic or social value, uh, was still heavily regulated. Um, and I, the court went back and forth on whether or not it could even be distributed over and over again. And I think that eventually it was no longer published, but there were some copies that were sold before that happened. So they're, they're hard to find. Uh, Michael Jackson, safe. Um, other things that can be regulated. Speech that is likely to lead to imminent lawless action may be prohibited. There is a statute that you will be cited for uh, known as inciting a riot if your speech is likely to lead to imminent lawless action. The government can ask you to leave under threat of administrative penalty, which basically means you're going to get a ticket for inciting a riot and possibly arrested. Uh, another restriction is fighting words. So words that are so insulting that a reasonable person would be likely to fight back, that may be prohibited. Uh, there's different restrictions for what considers what is considered to be fighting words, and that is a reasonable person standard. So, you know, while um, when the nation was first formed, uh, was first formed, I could have walked up to Han Hamilton and I could have called him a beef-witted mushroom, and he may have been justified to punch me in the face. If I were to walk up to somebody today and do that, I don't think that it would count. I don't think, I mean, other than the puzzled look I might get if they decided to hit me, I don't think a court would take their side. Uh, but if I were to say something, you know, particularly insulting to them, and typically fighting words is not merely an insult. Usually what we're talking about there is often a direct threat, a credible threat. Also, defamatory statements are also restricted, uh, forms of free speech. I can't simply say whatever I want although this is a lot more complicated than just saying something untrue because it depends on what's said, where it's said, how it's said, and who it's said about. And the uh, defamation um, statutes um, come with what is known as a requirement for mens rea, which means that they must have malice of forethought. They must have intent, uh, malicious intent, in order for it to be considered defamatory. So if I say something dumb, um, just trying to be funny or something like that, it's not a defamatory statement. I wasn't trying to hurt them. I just said something that was insensitive. And lastly, commercial speech, uh, obviously heavily regulated by the United States government. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission and so on regulates commercial speech. And there's various consumer protection agencies uh, that protect that as well. All right, so with individuals such as Andrew Tate, uh, and with the unmistakable blowback that we saw around 2010, 2012, the Arab Spring, social media, broadband internet, sharing pictures, sharing video, sharing news and information back and forth, the great egalitarian uprising, all people being equal, content not being restricted, information freely available to all, and a rising tide lifting all boats, what we should have seen then was a great revolution, right? And we did at first. But what we saw, just as with the results of the era of spring, is that not everyone was ready to let go. 
right? Those who could not benefit or did benefit from the status quo or could not benefit from a change in the status quo fought against that. And what we see now in our lifetimes, congratulations, everybody, we all get to enjoy it together, is a rise in fascism. I just mentioned a little while ago, the descendant of the, uh, what was his name, Oswald Mosley. Oswald Mosley, in the United Kingdom, prior to the rise of the Third Reich, this is the 1930s, the Nazi party in the 30s in Germany did not arise out of the primordial ooze just from chaos and nothingness. It was a response, just as we saw other fascist movements in other places rise up out of the same response, the same situation. The only difference is that in Germany, Hitler found a path to success. In the UK, for example, Oswald Mosley almost did. And when I say almost, I don't use that lightly. I mean, Mosley came very close to seizing power in the United Kingdom. And in an alternate universe somewhere else, the UK and Germany team up with Italy and Japan and win the war, right? They weren't the only ones. Spain had Franco, fascist movement. Italy, Mussolini, of course, um, and so on and so forth. All of that was a response, although they would, they would have you believe, uh, by they, I mean them, fascists, <laughs> would have you believe that the rise of fascism in the 30s was the result of essentially a logical conclusion. Socialism, social movements had gotten too powerful. They were taking too much. Reasonable people had to act, I would argue. As we mentioned before, with the rise of US hegemony, that the response and the rise of fascism back in the 30s was actually a response to once again, loss of control by those who had authority in the status quo. Only it wasn't the internet obviously back then, it was the rise of democracy, right? What happened just a couple, just a generation before the rise of fascism? Revolutions, right? French Revolution, the October Revolution in Russia and so on and so forth. So a loss of nobility, of status quo, right? A power vacuum. Well, with the rise of the communication platform of the internet, there's a vacuum there as well. And those, again, suffering from a loss of face in the status quo, choose to clamp down on that. But also those engaging in this platform also, sensing that vacuum, rush in to seize power. So we all get to enjoy a second rise of fascism as we do now. Uh, part of the reason why it's so effective is because, again, uh, the way that communication works on the internet is that it is entirely egalitarian, but also on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog, or uh, in the case of some mass manipulation techniques by, for example, white supremacists, nobody knows uh, that your 18 accounts are really just you in a trench coat, right, over and over again. And this effective messaging is also in part to what is known as the banality of evil, a term we will talk about again later. <laughs> but what it comes down to is that we become so desensitized to seeing terrible things on the internet that we scarcely bat an eye at it uh, to the point uh, where it just becomes a refrain such as the eponymous law of Godwin's law, which is, uh, way, way back. This goes way back, everybody. Way, way before any of you even were born to the Usenet days, uh, where essentially what Godwin's law is, is that sooner or later, if two people are arguing on the internet, eventually someone will compare one or the other or both to Nazis. Part of that is because it's such a, a, an easy impulse way to win an argument. You're just a fascist kind of a thing. But we do become desensitized to that to the point where when someone is spouting actual fascism, we call them a Nazi. They just say, oh, Godwin's law, way to go. But what's interesting is that we also live in an era where all of these changes are happening really fast. And all the information that we're sharing is preserved potentially forever, which is why Godwin's law, in our day and age, when we see these people, Godwin himself can descend from Mount Olympus. And give us an answer. By all means, compare these shitheads to the Nazis. Again and again, I'm with you. Proving that the eponymous law of Godwin himself, not necessarily universal and not necessarily erasing what is otherwise valid criticism from ideas, 
The problem with having a universal marketplace of ideas is that every idea stands on its own, but we also have no way of separating the wheat from the chaff, right? We have no way of knowing. The way that we've been given of separating the wheat from the chaff is with algorithms to promote or suppress content. Algorithms which are provided to us by private organizations with an economic agenda, an economic agenda that does not incentivize sharing actual information, but which incentivizes sharing incendiary or inflammatory information, which is why these kinds of messages from these people tend to be very visible. They elicit a lot of attention. In the beginning, in the beginning uh, prior to the Obama administration, uh, it seemed as if uh, white supremacy and uh, what, well, what became now crypto fascism um, was on a decline. But of course, a major incline brought about by the Obama administration, kind of election, of course, will revitalize those kinds of organizations. And then reinforced by their ability to communicate openly on the internet, obviously, uh, reinforcing all of this. Now, I study crime statistics all the time. And of course, the Trump administration was particularly concerned right away in the beginning with Islamic fascists or Islamic terrorists. And I'm not saying that there's not a valid concern there, but only about a quarter of all terrorism that happens to U.S. assets at home and abroad is a result of Islamic militism or fascism or, well, really any foreign ideology at all. Uh, the rest of that is the result of domestic terrorism, particularly white supremacists. So we don't look outward, or we, we don't look inward, we look outward. Um, let's continue this next week because I'm just noticing that we're about 10 after three. So we'll come back to this, I guess, and continue this on next week. Take care, enjoy your weekend.